गुड आफ्टरनून ऑनरेबल सी ए जी ऑफ इंडिया श्री जी सी मुर्मू सर एस्टीम मेम्बर्स ऑफ द सीनियर मैनेजमेंट सीनियर ऑफिसर्स ऑफ द आई एन ए डी बोथ प्रजेंट विथ अस इन दिस ऑडिटोरियम एज वेल एज द ऑफिसर्स हु हैव ज्वाइंड अस वाई द वेबकास्ट इन कंटिन्यूएशन ऑफ आर प्रैक्टिस ऑफ ऑर्गेनाइजिंग वेबिनार सेमिनार्स एंड लेक्चर्स फॉर नॉल नॉलेज इन्हेंसमेंट एंड शेयरिंग इट इज़ आर प्रिवलेज टू हैव अमंगस्ट अस टूडे प्रोफेसर Rajendra Rajeshwar Upadhyay he shall be delivering a session on leading with emotional intelligence inner reaches of outer excellence i now invite adi ir and coordination ma'am rebecca mathai to deliver the opening remarks Thank you, Runil, the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, the Deputy CAG, members of the Senior Management, our guest speaker today, Professor Rajeshwar Upadhyay, and my dear friends, I welcome you all to this session today on leading with emotional intelligence, inner reaches of outer excellence. Professor, guest speakers before you have spoken to us on new accounting concepts or analyze the budget. emotional intelligence would seem like a new leap altogether and yet we wonder if there could be no better time for this conversation than now after 2 years when each one of us had had to endure losses and sickness of ourselves and of our dear ones and learn to extend our arms beyond that immediate circle having said that i presume that emotional intelligence covers a wide span of emotions of empathy humility as much as humor and a capacity to experience joy ladies and gentlemen professor upadhyay has over 28 years of experience in advising and building emotional intelligence culture in organizations in this time he has conducted training programs and consulted for government institutions corporates business schools in india south and southeast asia Europe and the USA. He is currently the Dean of Academy of Applied Emotional Intelligence and Director of Par Excellence Leadership Learning Solutions based in India. In his illustrious career, he is engaged with lamas from monasteries across the world and has had an intensive program for the Kung Fu nuns in Kathmandu. We are all mere auditors professor but this afternoon we are all ears for you. I welcome you to our office once again and invite you to deliver the talk on leading with emotional intelligence in a reaches of outer excellence. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, for your really kind introduction. And uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. and uh, welcome to this 90 minute uh, session on emotional intelligence now emotional intelligence as a phrase is about 20 25 years old but as a phenomena is as old as mankind in fact if you look at the epic ramayana uh, mahabharata there are full of situations where the characters have behaved either in the absence of emotional intelligence the divas carrying on versus or the presence of emotional intelligence when we talk about emotional intelligence it is very important to realize that in the last 10 years the research around emotional intelligence has become so rigorous that it has emerged as the single most critical factor that is a predictor of future and sustainable success so we have two equivalent people and we want to know which one of them is going to be more successful going forward very simply the one with higher emotional intelligence So what comprises the domain of emotional intelligence? Why has it become so critical? What comes in the way of emotional intelligence? So while I do my talk, please feel free to ask questions. Or make
parallel for most of the time. For the last 20,000 years, it run parallel. Last 300 years, it changed a little bit. And in the last 100 years, it become very steep in the curve. From your class 9 physics, rate of, rate of change. So in the early days, when the line is parallel to the x-axis, no slope, not much change. In the next stage, when the slope is slight, changes are there, but changes are predictable. Changes are verifiable. You take a ball and you roll it across the table, given the length of the table and speed with which you roll the ball, it is possible to say how long it will take. No matter who rolls the ball, same time. No matter where on earth you roll the ball, same time. This phase of human civilization is called the Newtonian day. Okay, Newton. So it's just a Newtonian phase. Newtonian phase has to do with verifiability and predictability. You can roll the ball, make the table twice as long, and the experimental finding will be coincident with the mathematical calculation. We have predictability and verifiability. Predict and verify gave birth to what is called the scientific temperament. The scientific temperament. But the scientific temperament has one more proposition. And the third proposition is falsifiability. That there is no truth except the extent to which you cannot prove it false. This is the definition of a modern mind. When you were in class 7, you did a pinhole camera experiment and you said rectilinear propagation of light. So by the time you're reaching class 9, you're saying no. Newton is saying it will diffract on sharp edges using wave theory of light. You rejected rectilinear propagation and took wave theory, rejected wave theory, packet theory, rejected packet theory, photon theory, rejected photon theory, dual nature. This is the idea of progress inherent in the scientific temperament. The idea of progress inherent in the scientific temperament, when it moves to the next wave, the technological and the digitalization wave, it becomes exponential. And the world we are in is called VUCA. That immense stability, predictable change, rapid and unpredictable change. VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. If you look at the rate with which technology has progressed and brought us to this position, the story that if you are in a London hotel and you have a chauffeur parked in the basement downstairs, you call your chauffeur and ask him to come, and immediately you call an Uber, the Uber will get to you faster. There are 120,000 cabs that are servicing New York City today. The statistics exist. If you were to replace all those cabs with Google cars, driverless, run by sensors and GPS, where the technologies are combinatorial, you will need only 9,000 cabs to serve equivalent of 1,20,000 cars. The environment we are in has largely galloped forward by what futurists call STEM, S-T-E-M, science, technology, mathematics, engineering. But STEM will gallop away in its own direction if it's not balanced with what is also called hiki, humanities, ethics, compassion, emotional intelligence, imagination, intuition. Of this picking emotional intelligence as very central and driving a culture of emotional intelligence in organizations is going to make the organization more productive. I personally believe that emotional intelligence is the soft infrastructure for nation building. The hard infrastructure of course will be driven by imperatives to build itself. The soft infrastructure, if it's not in place, the hard infrastructure will take that much longer and will be plagued with that many more problems. So what is the emotional intelligence? There are multiple definitions. You Google it, you get dozens of definitions. So I don't want to start with the definition. We'll try and understand what emotional intelligence is. What are the models of emotional intelligence? And which is the one that we can deep dive into to have a better understanding of what the domain is? But just to check from you, what do you think is emotional intelligence? What adjectives would you say? If I say this person is emotionally intelligent,
attributes do you think the person has? Just loudly, just tell me. Empathy. Empathy. Yes. What else? Empathy is one. Hmm? Yeah. Empathy is one, definitely. What else? Emotionally intelligent leader. Emotionally intelligent person. Ethics is ethical. High integrity. Unbiased. unbiased, fair, balanced, balanced, fair, unbiased. Okay. Yeah? Compassion. compassion. And what's the difference between empathy and compassion? We will tell you the difference. And in the dictionary, you may not be able to. Empathy plus action is compassion. You empathize, you understand the pain and the anguish. Now you're willing to do something about it. We will say you have compassion. Otherwise, you understand the challenge. You understand the pain. You understand the anguish. You can write poetry about it. That's empathy. But compassion is what we are really chasing, where you add action to empathy. So here are four components, largely, where all emotional intelligence literature will migrate. First of all, it's called perceiving emotions. How do you perceive emotions? Perceiving emotions in yourself, perceiving emotions in others. By looking at people's facial expression, looking at their eyes, looking at their body language, you should be able to say, while the person is saying, yes, yes, of course, sir, we'll do it, there is hesitancy in the tone. Are you able to perceive that? Or are you so full of your own agenda and what do you want to drive that these resonances are not available to your cognition? Perceiving emotions in yourself, perceiving emotions in others. Then you have emotions. Now, this is very interesting. How do you use emotions? Supposing I'm feeling very upset. Something has happened, an email has come, something else has not worked, I'm getting blamed for something that's not my fault. I'm feeling really upset. But in 10 minutes time, I need to address an audience and motivate and inspire them. Am I going to be subservient to an emotional state? Or am I going to snap out of this and get into an emotional state that is driving optimality, that will drive motivation and inspiration. And ability to do this, the extent to which you are not subservient to your emotional state, is the extent to which you are able to use emotions. So you can get into a mood, you can create the feelings inside of you, where you come in front of others and you are inspiring and you are motivating, you are not subservient to that. Because this audience has no locus standi on that event. All you are in a very happy mood, you are very joyous mood, you are feeling very great, you are feeling wonderful, this is superb, this is fantastic, oh life is so beautiful, the monsoons have come, and you are going to get into a negotiating situation. If you go in with this mood into that situation, you will be far more trusting than you should be, you will give the benefit of the doubt, you will miss out on many details, do you know that this will be so? And are you then able to bring up yourself into an emotional state? into an emotional mood that will make you optimal to the situation at hand. Once again, you are not subservient to your emotional state. You triumph it. The third one has to do with understanding emotions. Understanding emotions. What is my emotional state? An event has happened in life. The event is impacting me in a particular way. I am feeling angry. Now the thing is, the feeling of anger is biological. My response to the anger is psychological. Over oh, the feeling of anger, I don't have control. What I have control over is what I do about the anger. How I engage with the other. This choice. Understanding emotions is an event has happened that has upset me. I am feeling angry. An awareness that my anger will impact my thinking. My emotions will impact my thinking. My thinking will impact my actions. My action will impact the other. And there is a certain residue I will leave with the other. And awareness of this whole value chain is emotional self-awareness, is understanding emotions. In fact, if you can understand this a priori, that if I say this because I'm feeling like this, it might give me temporary satisfaction. But saying it will leave damaging residues with others I must from beforehand change the vocabulary, reinterpret the reality, and say it in a way that is constructive, future focused, solution oriented, inclusive, collaborative. 
This is what an emotionally intelligent person always does. It's future focused, not past focused. Solution oriented, not blame oriented. Inclusive, not exclusive. Collaborative, not solo. So perceiving emotions, understanding emotions, using emotions, understanding emotions, and the last one is managing emotions. How do I manage the emotions that I experience? How do I regulate my impulses? Over the feeling, I don't have control. What I have control over is what I do about the feeling. How do I manage my emotions? What do you think are some of the ways of managing emotions? You're feeling very upset. What can you do to manage your emotions? Go for a walk. Go for a walk. One thing. Go into a silence mode. But the silence is not withdrawal. The silence is seeking stability for more constructive dialogue, right? Otherwise, you know that in this dialogue will be covered with your emotion. You don't want the dialogue to be colored with the emotion. Okay, that's good. Music. Breathe. Deep breathing. Communicate with friends and family. So, variety of solutions are there. Recognize the emotion. Label the emotion. When you label the emotion, you can arrest its progress. For example, here is a hierarchy of emotions. If I am feeling irritated, if I don't nip it, I will feel annoyed. If I don't nip it, I will feel angry. If I don't nip, nip it, there will be rage. So there is a hierarchy of emotions. A hierarchy of emotions which I should be able to identify, label and regulate. Because as it moves up, my ability to control is diminishing dramatically. So perceive, use, understand and manage emotions. Everybody is emotionally intelligent. But to benefit from emotional intelligence, you have to be above a threshold level. Why are people not already there? What has come in the way of emotional intelligence? What do you think has come in the way of emotional intelligence? Ego, definitely ego. Yeah, certainty. I mean, ego, again ego. Yes. What else? Lack of awareness. Lack of awareness. Yeah. What else? Self-centered. Okay. Pull your camera a little back because all our reasons are self-related reasons. Pull your camera back. You can have filial reasons, familial reasons, be social reasons. Right. Right. I don't remember, and I'm sure you don't remember having one entire period in school that was devoted to self-awareness. Did we have anything like that? or collaboration? Did not. So not having giving emphasis. I believe the school system is the only terrorist organization in the world that has not been labeled as such. <laughs> Which of you have not felt terror below, before the exam? During the exam? After the exam? Before the result. <laughs> you remember when the teacher came in with a pile of report cards into the classroom? There was a pall of gloom in the class. As though you were in a morgue. And the teacher had sadistically arranged the report cards. The boy who stood first was on top. And as it progressed, 12th, 13th, 14th, your name is still not called out, 19th. And then you went to collect your report and your ears are burning with embarrassment or humiliation, whatever be the emotion. And as you take the report card and open it, the teacher has presumed color blindness on the part of your parents. <laughs> well, everything is in blue, some things are in red. And just in case the miss has been underlined. And that has begun to define for you what they think you are good at and this is what you are going to believe you are good at. The greatest tragedy of the human beings is that they will go to the grave or the crematorium with most of their potential still buried inside of them. So emotional intelligence, while there are many external reasons, there is one internal reason that I want to talk about. I'll just use the iPad. Can we? Wonderful. So if you take a reptile and crack its skull open and take a longitudinal section of the brain, it will look like that. 
jump many millions of years of evolution. Take a horse's brain. A longitudinal section of the horse's brain will look like that. Embedded in the mammalian brain is a reptilian brain. The reptilian brain took forever, longest time to evolve, so they're very well fused together. This is called the limbic system. The limbic system is the seat of powerful emotions. Lust, anger, envy, hatred, greed, the visceral, non-rational emotions. But they're there. Jump many millions of years of evolution, take a human brain. A longitudinal section of the human brain will look like that. Inside the human brain is a mammalian and a reptilian brain, which is called the primitive brain. This new brain is called the neocortex. Neo means new cortex. The new cortex is the seed of reason. Seed of reason. The new cortex grew very rapidly. In fact, it grew so rapidly that it did not integrate with the limbic system. Metaphorically, it's possible to hold the neocortex and peel it off. The schizophrenia between rationality and emotionality has a biological basis. It is there to stay. It is part of the human predicament. The history of the world is the history of war. The Ramayana and the Mahabharata are tales of bloody wars. Trojan War lasted for 10 long years. Milton describes the war between gods and demons in paradise lost. World War I and World War II. The world's capacity to destroy the world. The neocortex. The seat of reason. In fact, the neocortex grew so rapidly that if anything in your body grows at an equivalent pace, the doctors will consider it malignant. So the neocortex is like a cancerous growth sitting on the limbic system, unintegrated by it. Now, lust, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed. If they are so bad, why are they there? Why are they there? Do you think you can write a best-selling novel or best-selling book, Uses of Lust? Bertrand Russell wrote a book called Uses of Boredom. Only when you are bored and you left your mind fallow like that, will great insights and creativity happen. Uses of Boredom. Why are they there? If you watch Animal Planet or National Geographic, you will notice either the animal is eating or being eaten. Early in the days, Anything that helped survival was good. Anything that hindered survival was bad. Good and bad were black and white. Lust means more progeny. So even if large number of individual creatures die, the species must survive. Nature is interested in the survival of the species. Morality is a social construct. See? But as society passed, and as society developed, they said that all your behaviors have to fall within a bell curve. And we will have a latitude of tolerance around the norm. Therefore, you are normal. If your behaviors are at the tail end, you are abnormal, you go to the jail. If your behaviors are at the head end, you are abnormal and you will go to the asylum. George Bernard Shaw used to, however, say, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. The reasonable man is too busy complying. Normal. The purpose of religion, philosophy, psychology, therapy, policing, administrative, constitutional system is to bring you back to the norm so that carry on being normal. So lust, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, while they were optimal at that point of time, today they'll be punitively met. But over the emotion, you know, one of the challenges that we have, the brain is two million years old. Our institutions, I'm told, is 17th or 18th century. But technologies are 21st century and galloping. And bringing these three together is going to be one hell of a task. Let me give you an example. The story of a couple from the US that are completing 25 years of their marriage. They want to celebrate that. They've come to Agra. They're sitting in front of the Taj Mahal, holding each other's hand and looking at the moon, beams, bounce off that beauty. Suddenly the man begins to breathe heavily. He begins to become more breathless. He falls on the ground. He begins to spasm. The hospital in Philadelphia that put the pacemaker know this is so. And from that distance can send him a shock that can revive his heart, stabilize him so that he can now seek clinical attention. That's the miracle of technology. 
But can you imagine a terrorist organization that has access to a database of people and has now the ability to send shockwaves to the heart that doesn't need it? So while you have STEM, you need to have hickey on the other side. And that is what is required. Where do you think empathy and compassion, forgiveness and tenderness, love and affection, where do you think they are located in the brain? They are all located in the frontal lobe of the neocortex. Right here in the frontal lobe. When we said third eye, maybe that is what we meant. Third eye. And that is because the neocortex grew from behind. So love, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed are very embedded emotions, they are visceral, they are very powerful. The compassion and empathy are evolutionary terms far more recent and are located in the so emotional intelligence has to be a variation on a neocortical intervention in the limbic system, generating an array of alternatives, evaluating each and choosing the one that is optimal. And optimality comprises an appreciation of the future implications of present actions. In fact, the unintended consequences of present actions. Let me try and show you a film clip that demonstrates emotional intelligence in action. And in this clip, I want you to look for the following attributes. I want you to look for self-regard, emotional self-awareness, assertiveness, empathy, social responsibility, problem solving, stress tolerance. Okay, one more. Optimism. Yeah, I'll say it again. Self-regard. Self-regard is self-worth, self-significance. It means ego. Freud said ego. Ego means self-worth, self-significance. Problem is egoism and egotism. So ego is swabhiman, not ahankar. Therefore, self-regard. Emotional self-awareness is awareness of how an event has impacted my emotion, emotion impacting my thinking, my thinking will impact my actions, my action will leave a residue with the others. This whole value chain is emotional self-awareness. Have assertiveness, empathy. Assertiveness, I want to tell you, let's define it in a certain way. Assertiveness means speaking up and speaking out, saying what you think is right but saying it in a constructive, solution-oriented manner, not destructive manner. So assertiveness is speaking up and speaking out, but in a socially acceptable, non-destructive, non-abusive manner. Empathy. Empathy is getting into the other people's shoes, understanding what their pain is, and acting on it. Right? Social responsibility is an interesting one. Most organizations are now mandated to have a triple bottom line. The first bottom line is people, planet, profit. Problem solving is solving problems in situations where emotions are involved. It's not about solving problems with the tools and techniques of solving problems. It's about solving problems in situations where emotions are involved. Then you have stress tolerance. Are you able to tolerate the stress that the VUCA world throws at you? Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world throws at you, and optimism. Optimism, very simply, is the belief that I can impact the outcome. Optimism is not this positive attitude where you're jumping around with energy. Optimism is the quiet belief that I can impact the outcome. It doesn't say, I don't know how, but I'm going to go to the ground level, talk to people, figure out, demonstrate my resourcefulness. That is optimism. So let's look at this movie clip. If you can change the screen, please. This is the story of Nelson Mandela, one slice of his life. Nelson Mandela has spent 27 years in prison, uh, campaigned for four years, become the president of South Africa. The clip I'm going to show you is his first few minutes in the South Africa White House, where he sees, says, and does certain things. Now, South Africa is in bad shape. Crime, currency, unemployment, poverty, housing, diseases, and now reverse appetite. The black people feel it's time to take revenge on the white people. In fact, if he created 
a criteria that could lead to civil war, South Africa is right for one. Nelson Mandela must do what he can to stop that from happening. Let's look at this clip. First few minutes in the South Africa White House, he says, says and does certain things. With white fears. Yeah, I never thought I'd see the day. Raise the volume, please. I feel sorry for you, son. You got your whole life ahead of you. What's it going to be like now? Uh, don't be so gloomy. Yeah. Now I added vitamins. There's a horrible flu bug going around. You tell Marine when you get home, eh? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'm telling you, Francois. Look at Angola. Look at Mozambique. And look at Zimbabwe. We're next. I'm going to take our jobs and I'm going to drive us into the sea. Still wait. So I put this clip because it kind of metaphorically captures the sentiment of the white people. The elderly generation are going to say, look at other examples, they're going to go down the tube. The lady is saying that, you know, he's far too pessimistic than he should be. The boy is a little apathetic. Looking at how situations shape up, he will make his deductions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ah, Brenda, you've had your hair done. I like it. Thank you, Vijiba. Yeah, we need to talk about your cabinet appointments and ministers. Give me one moment, please. Yes, Ndiba. After you, Comrade President. Thank you, sir. Office of the President, good morning. Brenda, please assemble all the staff for me. All those who haven't already left. Right now? All of them? Yes, please. Yes, Ndiba. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to follow me, please. The president would like to speak with you. Here he comes. Yeah. He wants the satisfaction of firing us himself. I'd like you to stay out here. Yes, but what even I cannot speak. talk to them hiding behind men with guns. <laughs> Going more, Alma. Good morning. How are you this morning? Fine. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming on such short notice. Some of you may know who I am. I could not help noticing the empty offices as I came to work this morning and all of the packing boxes. Now, of course, if you want to leave, that is your right. And if you feel in your heart that you cannot work with your new government, then it is better that you do leave right away. But if you are packing up because you fear that uh, your language or the color of your skin or who you worked for before disqualifies you from working here, I am here to tell you, have no such fear. What is Rebay is Rebay. The past is the past. We look to the future now. We need your help. We want your help. If you would like to stay, you would be doing your country a great service. All I ask is that you do your work to the best of your abilities and with good heart. I promise to do the same. If we can manage that, our country will be a shining light in the world. Yes. So what do you see in this clip? He's so sensitive, as he comes into the room, he gets a smell of the place. Nobody's telling him attrition figures. He says, I could not help noticing empty offices and packing boxes. 
And when he notices that, he must immediately address the attention. He is not delegating it to Brenda. He could have. Brenda, tell them not to go. I, I let them stay. I have not asked them to go. So why are they going? Let them stay. No. He is not saying, Brenda, my calendar looks better on Thursday. Today, of course, all these meetings you only have lined up. Tell them they can go, but they can come back on Thursday and I'll talk with them. No. He is going there personally, face to face, in a room maybe one fifth the size of this room. See? What did you notice? What, what did you find remarkable in this clip? Hmm? Right. Treating them as equal. Yeah. He, he could read their status, what they are thinking, right. what is there in their mind, yes. and how emotionally surcharged they are, That's right. and how he should address them to Correct. sort of address their fears Correct. and do something which soothes them out. Right, right. Treat them as a team. Right. Teamwork to achieve something. Right, right. Yeah. Reassuring, assuring, and reassuring. So, which part is empathy? Which part is empathy? It's a form of empathy. It's a form of empathy. It's a kind of place for a nation. Huh? Yes? Understanding the insecurities. That's right. And what are the insecurities? If you feel the color of your skin, your language, as soon as you come into the room, I'll know the color. It's different. Your language and who you worked for before. The efficiency of the ruthlessness came from people like you. But if you think these three, because those three things is what they are thinking. But if you think these three things disqualify you, I am here to tell you, have no such fear. Who am I? I'm the president of South Africa. Beyond me, there is God. And I'm telling you, have no such fear. But why not? Because we look to the future. The past is the past. Is he assertive? Do you find him assertive? Which part? If you feel in your heart you cannot work with your new government, which means the new philosophy, the non-apartheid philosophy. If you feel, you know, I've never sat in a bus with these black guys, what the hell am I going to work 12 hours a day with them? If you feel this, then it is better that you do leave. When? Right away. See? What else do you notice in this clip? Right, 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 absolutely. There's an aspiration he has, right? A vision for everybody, okay? Yes? What else? He's in control of things. He's in control of things. Right, right. See? Very good. Right, right. I will, see, that's such a beautiful thing to say. What is he saying? All I ask, look at this short speech, has everything packed in it. There is an expectation. In first speech, in the first few minutes, he will tell everybody, all I ask, there's an expectation. And what is the expectation that? You work to the best of your ability and with good heart, both. Head and heart, competence and warmth. All I ask, you do your work to the best of your ability and with good heart. And the next part is, that half the equation. The second half of the equation is, I promise to do the same. I promise to do the same. And then he says, if we can manage that, then this country will be a shining light to the world. This country will be a shining light to the world. Why shining light? It's an interesting use of phrase. Because Africa is a dark continent. The shining light, there's a lamp there that will give example to everybody how to shed past animosity, how not try to balance the equations of past wrongdoing, how to be future focused. That is the example we will be. So if you look at all the dimensions of emotional intelligence that I wrote, does he have high self-regard, self-confidence? Yes. Second one was? Appreciative. Is he emotionally expressive? Appreciative? Was he assertive? Yes. Was he empathic? Yes. Then? Social responsibility. Responsible for society? Then? Optimism. The belief that I can change the outcome. 
stress tolerance. So he's going through a lot in his own personal life as well. And he's able to deal with that and none of that filters through to adversely impact the other. Let's look at the idea of emotional self-awareness. What do you think? Emotional self-awareness. When he came into the room, he saw people's facial expression. He said, this is not the expression I want. This is the expression I want. What must I say straight away, immediately? The pebble in their shoe that is paining them needs to be taken off at once. So Brenda is surprised. She just told him there are secretaries and ministers. And he says, assemble everybody because I'm going to do that first. A good leader knows the big thing as big and the small thing as small. Postponing that meeting by an hour or so is small. Letting these people go is big. And when these people are going, what is breaking news on every TV channel? White House begins ethnic cleansing. No, Black president enters, white staff exit. That's not his intention. So how much PR to undo that damage? Someone who understands, empathizes, is sensitive, and behaves in a manner that is inclusive, collaborative, future-focused, solution-oriented. So there are different psychometric tools and that can tell you about different dimensions. There are some that have 15 dimensions and allow you to look at yourself. And how am I faring on these? And using that to decide what aspects do you need to develop to become more emotionally intelligent. So emotional intelligence is very central to leadership success, to collaboration, and to building teams, to building organizations. Any questions at this stage? Any comments? Yes, yes. This whole movie is actually a textbook example of emotional intelligence. And also a textbook example of level five leader. The something that we sent to you as, as pre-read, the level five leader. Yes. Right. Correct. Facial expression of people, how it changed as a consequence of the speech, the communication that he had. Yes. Yes. Greeted them in their language. Yes. Hmm. Correct. Correct. Yes, that's right. And we have deviated from that core and how to come back and operate from that one particular core. Okay, yes. Any other comments or questions before I move to the next part? Okay, so let's look at, if I can have the uh, iPad projected please. On the x-axis, if I put competence, On the y-axis, I will put warmth. Low, low, high, high. You'll get an interesting two by two. If someone is low on competence, low on warmth, other people's response to this person is contempt. Contempt. Low on warmth, low on competence, other people's response is contempt. A person who is high on warmth and low on competence. High on warmth means the person is warm, tender, gentle, caring, loving, giving, forgiving, hugs people, wishes them birthdays, anniversaries, remembers all of that, very warm and caring, but is not competent. Other people's response to this person will be pity. Nice guy, a good human being. Insan acha hai, lekin kaam mat maangu usse. Kaam nahi hoga. He can, his goodness is a mask for his incompetence. But let it be. Let him float around the corridors. I mean, I don't have the heart to do anything else with him. If you're high on competence, you can finish your work on time, every time, error-free, personally. You can, the team members are not there, supporting you, you'll do it yourself, no problem. You can talk to the gangman, you can talk to the railway board. You, you have that dexterity, high on competence, but low on warmth. Other people's response to you will be envy, fear. 
more fear than envy. And that is not a good place for others to be in with vis-a-vis -vis you. Then you have, if you are high on competence and high on warmth, other people's response to you is admiration. High on competence and high on warmth with a caveat. Warmth first. First demonstrate warmth. First demonstrate relatedness. First build a relationship. First build rapport. First build trust. Now having built this, your competence will find traction. So, competence and warmth, warmth first. And what do we mean by warmth? We mean emotionally intelligent behaviors. So you're empathic, you're compassionate, you reach out to the other person, you are appreciative in your orientation, not dismissive, judgmental, contemptuous, negative, sarcastic, which are default emotion, comes far more easily to us, does it not? Sarcasm comes so easily to us, contempt. Our mind spots the negative and the bad so quickly. And that's good. You know, it used to do that. When in early days of the evolution, uh, it was good for us to spot the negative and the bad and mistrust something. It served us well. But now that is gone, but the brain operating way hasn't gone. Therefore, we got to build in a natural ability to trust, build rapport, build relationships. Once the relationship is built, the other person will listen to you more, will understand you more, will know where you are coming from, will know what you are about. If you can give the impression to the other person that, hey, you and I are on the same side. You and I are on the same side. I'm here to make you successful. I'm here to make your success sustainable. And if I ask you hard questions, it is because it will serve you better than me not asking those hard questions. If I'm emotionally intelligent, I will be able to converse, build rapport, build relationship, build trust, and extract the kind of information that is constructive, solution-oriented, future-focused. The real purpose of emotional intelligence is what? What do you think is the final purpose of emotion? When I say building a culture of emotional intelligence, that's what we're trying to do at the Indian Railways, and they have taken this forward rather seriously. In fact, they have made it part of the selection process at senior level. There's a policy to that effect. Because when they went through, you know, we put the GMs, the DRMs, and the SAG officers through the emotional intelligence training, and we got them to see their own reports and look at their scores and make meaning and have insights about themselves. For the first time, or in a long time, I am at the center of my own learning. This reflection, this introspection, this cognition or recognition is such a central part of personal growth and development. And it is, it gives so much of insight on what you can do and how you can become your true potential, whoever you were supposed to be. You're supposed to become the best version of yourself. You're not supposed to become the best. You're supposed to become your best. That's a different game altogether. How to become my own best is the journey of emotional intelligence. So, the final outcome of emotional intelligence is, here I'm going to write productivity. All organizations are chasing productivity. Productivity is a genuine pursuit. On the y-axis, more and more organizations are talking about happiness. Productivity and happiness, I again get out two by two. If you are low on productivity and low on happiness, that is the living definition of hell. You are neither productive nor you are happy. You are not actualizing, you are not doing what you want to do. This is what it calls an EMI trap. I had a friend of mine who used to work for an advertising firm on the 13th floor of the Express Towers in Bombay. Beautiful office, overlooking the sea, guggling with delight. And he said, I don't like my job. I don't like my boss. I don't like my client, but I have no option. You know, Rajeshwar, I'm leading an EMI life, his phrase. So Monday to Friday, I do what I do so that I can have Saturday and Sunday. So my life is Monday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> if I have 8 lakhs of EMI to pay per month, what actualization are you talking about? So living hell. High on happiness, low on productivity, 
really is not sustainable. Because what is happiness actually? Happiness is actualizing through work. What you do, what you love to do. What you love to do, what energizes you. Happiness is that which energizes you. If you make a list of things that energize me and a list of things that exhaust me, can you reduce your exhaustion list and increase your energization list, your happiness will automatically go up. But I'll bring in one more component to happiness in just a minute. Happiness. You're high on productivity, low on happiness. You don't like anything, but you're stretching yourself. It's like swallowing sponge. You're doing more and more. And each day, the more you work, the worse it gets. The harder you try, the poorer it gets. Are you going to burn out? If you're high on productivity and high on happiness, that is the real goal of emotional intelligence. With a caveat, happiness first. Do not sacrifice your today for a greater tomorrow. All research on happiness shows if you are happier today, if you are more positive today, if you are more fulfilled today, then you will chase more and do more. There is an author called Phil Zombardo. Phil Zombardo said, why are some cultures rich and some cultures poor? I said, ah, now I understand. Cultures that are rich are the one because of their relationship with time. So you have time, past, time present and time future. This is Phil Zombardo. Cultures of poverty and cultures of affluence. Cultures of poverty, past, negative. Where I came from, where I grew up, what poverty. We all spent time in one room. I didn't even have a shoe. In fact, the shoe that I borrowed was from my father for the interview. I stuffed it with cotton and I somehow made it to the interview. Past and negative. Present fatalistic. What option do I have? What can I do? Do I have any options? I don't like this. I don't like that. My friend. So present fatalistic. No, not much options. Almost every war movie, every Hindi war movie that you watch, at the peak of its time, the hero will declare, Akhir in halato mein hum kar bhi sakte hain. There is a profound romance in that helplessness. Present fatalistic. I don't have choice. I don't have that much choice. I can't leave and go. I can't abandon this, etc. And future, transcendent. This is Phil Zumbado's research. Future, transcendent. Shraddha Saburi. There is a cosmic balance sheet in which all your deeds are being entered. Good deeds and bad. At the end of time, there will be a revaluation. And finally, all equations will be balanced. You may not be around, it will be balanced in the cosmic space. Aneka janma samprapta. Karma bandha vidahine. Okay. Culture of affluence, past positive. It doesn't matter where I came from, it is where I'm headed. Of course, my mother was an alcoholic and she was a single mother, but that has taught me the value of family. That has taught me the value of relationship. That has taught me how I must protect and covet what I already have. Past positive. Present. He calls it moderate hedonism. The pursuit of personal gratification. The pursuit of personal fulfillment. And this is not just decadent pleasure. This has to do with what do I like to do? I like to read, I like to trek, I like to travel, I like to write, I like to watch movies. What do I like to do? I must do what I like to do because that will give me energy to do what I have to do. So moderate hedonism and future Goal oriented, short term. What am I going to achieve in the next six months? What all am I going to learn? What all am I going to do? What am I going to complete? What relationships am I going to build? I am headed somewhere every day of my life. I'm not somnambulistic. I'm not somnambulistic about my life. Steve Jobs has a speech to the graduating students of Stanford. I don't know if you've heard. But one part he says, I stand in front of the mirror every day and ask myself this question. If today was the last day of my life, would I be doing what I'm about to do? And when the answer is no for many days in a row, I know it's time to change something. The fact that you are born means you are going to die. Death is life's greatest clearing agent. You have no business leading anybody else's life but your own. 
ancient India calls this Swadharma as against Parodharma. Swadharma. The Japanese call it Ikigai. And there's a nice book in the market on Ikigai which is worth reading. They are saying, first of all, make a list of everything that you love to do. What do you love to do? Make a list. Make another list of things that you are good at doing. See, you have an interesting overlap area. Things that you love to do and things that you are good at doing. If this is what you love to do and you are good at doing, then effort has become effortless. Then effort has become effortless. So very often you will find people who work 10, 12, 14 hours a day, go fly in, take a red eye flight, early morning land, come, do, and say, my God, sir, up konsa pranayama karto? Kya diet hai aapka? Koi mantra ucharan karto? Where do you get this energy from? He gets his energy from just loving what he does because it energizes him. So you have two overlaps. What do I love to do? What I am good at doing? And the third one is called, what do others need? It just cannot be about myself and my fulfillment. What do others need? What do others need? We have time up to 4.30, right? Yeah, okay. What do others need? And this is the overlap. There's a story about Vyasa. When he finished writing the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata is a very voluminous text. It is larger than the Odyssey and the Iliad put together by 29 times. You take an Odyssey, Iliad, multiply that by 29, the Mahabharata will still be longer. After he finished writing this, he gave it to other rishis for peer review. Just let me tell you how it is. So they read it very quickly. They said, my God, this is fantastic, this is wonderful, this is incredible, this is a civilizational contribution, Vyasa. But who is the TG? Vyasa said, TG? A target group. I said, uh, mankind. Mankind? All of mankind? Do you really think mankind is going to read through this whole volume to benefit from it? Vyasa, we have a request. Can you make an executive summary? <laughs> Vyasa said, yes, yes, it's possible. He made an executive summary. They read through it and it said 14 pages. Wonderful. Good. It's a good summary. Fantastic. It has captured the essence of the Mahabharata Vyasa. But even this is too much. Can you reduce it to one page? Vyasa said, sure, sure, it can be. Then they are calling out behind him as he's walking out of the mud plastered kutia. Font 11, type Arial, spacing one and a half. Vyasa smiles and says, done. And he brings in a one pager. They look at that and they read and they say, Vyasa, this is fantastic, this is incredible, this is wonderful, this is not the essence, this is the quintessence of the Mahabharata. But would you be able to reduce it to one shloka? Vyasa said, yes, yes. And Vyasa put together that one shloka. That one beautiful shloka. So many gems studied together. So nuanced and so beautiful. That if you read it as Ratnakar and went in, you would come out transformed as Valmiki. Go in Siddhartha, come out Buddha Gautama. Go in Narendra Navdatta, come out Vivekananda. They said, my God, what to say, Vyasa? You're a master craftsman. But most human beings do not have the psycho-spiritual maturity to engage with the shloka like this one. Vyasa, can you reduce it to one word? And Vyasa said, what do you think he said? Paropakar. Paropakar. Do good to the others. You came with nothing. You will go with absolute nothing. In the middle, can you readjust your binocular? Can you really understand, wherever you are, contribute, help, give, in retrospect, whose life became better because you were there? Whose life became better because you were there? What systemic changes, even if silently and invisibly did you make, that made a fundamental contribution to the environment that you were operating in? The pursuit of emotionally intelligent people, that's how they are actualizing. Authentic actualization is so central to emotional intelligence. In fact, the more emotionally intelligent you become, the more actualizing you will become. The more actualizing you become, the happier you will become. So the relationship between happiness and emotional intelligence is a cyclic one. The happier you are, the more emotionally intelligent you will be. The more emotionally intelligent you are, the happier you will be. Now, at an organizational level, there is one piece of input which, I, which, which is there in the art, article level 5 leadership. It's a very powerful story. 
because the level 5 leadership says can you look at the last 30 years and look at organizations that have underperformed the stock market for 15 years somebody enters and then they outperform the stock market by at least 3 times greater than 3 times brief to the research team they looked at fortune 500 companies of 1645 fortune 500 companies spread over 30 years they looked at all of that and they came up with 11 such companies 11 companies that had outperformed the stock market when they looked at the 11 companies they had outperformed the ones where somebody had entered at the nadir point when everything is gone there is no hope all the facts are saying no hope but faith is saying we will do it make this country make this organization a shining light at the point of nadir 11 people and when they looked at how had the stock market performed they had performed more than 6.9 times so the level 5 leader, they called him level 5 because when they interviewed and spoke to all these 11, they all seemed to be cut from the same cloth. They all seemed to be saying, doing, believing, valuing the same thing. And the things that they were valuing was, or the thing that they were doing was, humility. And incredible will. Humility and will. All 11 of them. Until then, Jim Collins had looked at the level one leader is hyper competent. Given his domain, his domain knowledge and domain mastery is truly exceptional. He's not just competent, he's hyper competent. The level two leader is not only the one who's hyper competent, but is actually collaborative. Team player, team builder, builds the team, runs the team allows leadership to migrate within the team. So I am not an IT guy, I don't understand IT, I don't understand platform, but you know Suresh, you do. I want you to lead this project and we will all report to you. So allows leadership to migrate to the most competent person, is collaborative, team player, works with others. The level three leader, it's outstanding in that, is resourceful. New problems, different problems, more problems, figures out what is required. Does not ask for more resources, demonstrates resourcefulness, lateralizes, brings in creative ideas, new ideas, benchmarks with others, experiments, runs pilot projects, figures out how to do more with less. Genuinely, inside out, is resourceful. The level four leader is strategic and has vision, motivates and inspires people. But the level four leader operates from ego. I did. I was there. I made a difference. I brought out fundamental changes. I put the bell curve and eliminated those bottom uh, feeders in the organization. That's how we have survived today. I do the ROI. I drive. I talk to the media. I am visible. I am audible. I am known. I am admired. He was a level four leader. So the level four leader had a 50% failure rate in the dustbin of history successful leaders who failed could not sustain their success all come from the level four the level four leader does not sustain is too focused on himself not sorry huh? ahankar aham means i am center i am at the center i am significant i am important because of me this is happening i brought about the changes i did this thing the sense of i blinds himself and is very sensitive to adverse feedback Therefore, collects people around him who align with him and who say and do what he thinks should be said and done. As new, no new information comes in, no new understanding comes in, no new challenges come in, there are new thinking does not happen and the old order does not work. So the old order changeth, yielding place to the new. And God fulfills himself in many ways. Lest one good custom should corrupt the world. One good best practice 10 years ago could be a most damaging practice today. Are you continuously challenging your operating assumptions, finding which of these are suboptimal, eliminating it in favor of better set of assumptions, which too is falsifiable? There is no truth except the extent to which you cannot prove it false. Therefore, this is the level 4 leader. 
then the level 5 leader is a remarkable finding the level 5 leader is quiet humble humble and has incredible will is humble he gives credit he does not give credit as a strategy ki main credit deta hu dusro ko credit deta hai he gives credit because he says you know that thing um yes 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 it is a success we were successful that bad because lata was there suresh was there and luckily one regulation in the government changed and this whole opportunity we were fortunate to be all attribution to external because he can see from his wise mind that there is no mono causality to an outcome how can one cause have one outcome one outcome has multiple causes and we don't know which are the threshold causes and therefore i will automatically say no 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 well, do many things so that i can't take credit you want to talk about how this happened successfully go talk to suresh go talk to lata so continuously the external world does not know the level 5 leader they only know how successful an incredibly successful the organization is and how people are being developed so the level 5 leader gives credit but takes blame he's thinking you know i was at the helm of affairs i was at the top i had a line of sight on everything i missed something it is my fault jim called me done the research is saying that sounds very corny he gives credit and takes blame okay let's find out and he says that we went and spoke to all those 11 people many of them didn't know each other from across industries and sectors from across seniority and we noticed that whether or not anything was happening they were true to themselves what they were saying is true they believed in what they were saying they believed that they had not caused the success they believed that they were responsible for the failure there was no pretense they were operating from essence and this is the level 5 leader humble so what are the elements so the level 5 leader once again is a textbook example of an emotionally intelligent leader driving productivity and driving work level 5 leaders very often underestimates themselves they know what all they don't know so one example in a particular beautiful article is a person called darwin smith darwin smith was the board said darwin you are now the ceo and darwin looked around and said oh, me okay he was surprised by this other people came to him and said you know darwin they have made you the ceo i don't think they have thought this through it's definitely a wrong decision you're not ready you know darwin he says yeah 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 it's true it's true it's true but he remained the ceo for next 20 years causing the turnaround of their organization and a dramatic growth in their organization and much later he says you know i never thought i knew there were so many people inside the organization who could do this job better than me therefore i never stopped trying to be fit for the job there are so many others who can do this better than me then i must do better and in that trying that incredible humility incredible humility from that humility there is an appreciative orientation looking for the good appreciative orientation and there is gratitude this is coming from humility from will there is coming resilience and optimism ऑप्टिमिज्म इज सेइंग आई कैन इंपैक्ट द आउटकम मुझे पता नहीं कैसे लेकिन कर सकते हैं कुछ तो कर सकते हैं मैं जाऊंगा देखूंगा बात करूंगा मैं दूसरों से मिलूंगा पता लगाऊंगा और किसने ऐसे प्रॉब्लम को झेला है क्या किया उन्होंने व्हाट इज दे डू द बिलीफ दैट आई कैन इंपैक्ट द आउटकम इज ऑप्टिमिज्म एंड स्टेइंग विद दैट फॉर अ लॉन्ग ड्यूरेशन ऑफ टाइम इज रेजिलिएंस सो मोस्ट लीडर्स विद हायर रेजिलिएंस विल सक्सीड बिकॉज़ दे स्टेड विद द प्रॉब्लम दैट मच लॉन्गर others who gave up earlier in the day couldn't get to see the outcome this person stayed with it longer and therefore there's a greater chance of survival and success so emotionally intelligent leaders are the order and the need of the day in fact emotionally intelligent leaders have what is called learning agility in a vuka environment if everything is changing changing in complexity the one thing you will absolutely need to be is to stay relevant if regulations are changing technology is changing environment is changing expectations are changing challenges are changing how can you remain in sthita prajna how can you remain stable and not changing not evolving not growing one of the greatest challenges for us is to carry on remaining relevant i will just draw one diagram from the exponential curve that we had 
If you take a look at the last part of the exponential curve, we said it's like that. This is time t. On here, I can say market share. I can say problem solved. I can say number of people motivated. I can say many things. At time t1, you're saying I'm the best. I'm very good. I'm very competent. I'm very admired. Other people write case studies on me. We are in the lecturing circuit. We tell others. We drain and groom others to do this. We didn't get here by accident. We got here because we got some core competencies. So we should carry on doing what we are doing and just do it better. At the end of time T2, you will have moved there. But look, the environment has moved there. Simply by staying where you are, you have fallen behind by that much. In the present context, if you are not becoming better, you are becoming worse. If you are not growing, you are decaying. If you are not progressing, you are regressing. There is no status quo. Because the rest of the environment is galloping ahead. What I want to show you in conclusion is the idea of happiness. I have an outstanding video. And with your permission, even that Sam Manusha video is damn good. Now this. And this video is on happiness. This video is on happiness. And um, so just enjoy the talk, and then we'll have a brief discussion, and then close for the day. Because happiness, indeed, is the pursuit of emotional intelligence. And higher happiness means higher productivity. When I was seven years old and my sister was just five years old, we were playing on top of a bunk bed. I was two years older than my sister at the time. I mean, I'm two years older than her now, but at the, <laughs> at the time that meant she had to do everything that I wanted to do and I wanted to play war. So we were up on top of our bunk beds and on one side of the bunk bed I had put out all my G.I. Joe soldiers and weaponry and on the other side were all my sisters, my Lois and ponies and ready for a cavalry charge. There are differing accounts of what actually happened that afternoon, but since my sister is not here with us today, um, let me tell you the true story. <laughs> Which is my sister is a little bit on the clumsy side, and somehow, without any help or push from her older brother at all, suddenly Amy disappeared off of the top of the bunk bed and landed with this crash on the floor. And I nervously peered over the side of the bed to see what had befallen my fallen sister and saw that she had landed painfully on her hands and knees on all fours on the ground. I was nervous because my parents had charged me with making sure that my sister and I played as safely and as quietly as possible. And seeing as how I had accidentally broken Amy's arm just one week before, <laughs> heroically pushing her out of the way of an oncoming imaginary sniper bullet, <laughs> for which I have yet to be thanked. I was trying as hard as I could she didn't even see it coming. I was trying as hard as I could to be on my best behavior, and I saw my sister's face this wail of pain and suffering and surprise, threatening to erupt from her mouth and threatening to wake my parents from the long winter's nap for which they had settled. So I did the only thing my little frantic seven-year-old brain could think to do to avert this tragedy. If you have children, you've seen this hundreds of times before. I said, Amy, Amy, wait, don't cry, don't cry. Did you see how you landed? No human lands on all fours like that. <laughs> Amy, I think this means you're a unicorn. Now that was cheating because there's nothing in the world my sister would want more than not to be Amy the hurt five-year-old little sister, but Amy the special unicorn. Of course, this was an option that was open to her brain at no point in the past. And you could see on my poor, manipulated sister's face conflict. <laughs> As her little brain attempted to devote resources to feeling the pain and suffering surprise she just experienced, or contemplating her newfound identity as a unicorn. <laughs> And the latter one out. Instead of crying, instead of ceasing our play, instead of waking my parents with all the negative consequences that would have ensued for me. Instead, a smile spread across her face, and she scrambled right back up onto the bunk bed with all the grace of a baby unicorn. <laughs> with one broken leg. Well, we stumbled across. 
at this tender age, which is five and seven, we had no idea at the time, was something that was going to be at the vanguard of a scientific revolution occurring two decades later in the way that we look at the human brain. What we had stumbled across is something called positive psychology, which is the reason that I'm here today and the reason that I wake up every morning. When I first started to talk about this research outside of academia, out with companies and schools, the very first thing they said to never do is to start your talk with a graph. The very first thing I wanted to do is start my talk with a graph. <laughs> this graph looks boring, but this graph is the reason that I get excited and wake up every morning. And this graph doesn't even mean anything. It's fake data. What we found is... <laughs> If I got this data back studying you here in the room, I would be thrilled because there's very clearly a trend that's going on there and that means that I can get published, which is all that really matters. <laughs> the fact that there's one weird red dot that's up above the curve, there's one weird in the room, you know who you are, I saw you earlier. <laughs> that's no problem. That's no problem as most of you know because I can just delete that dot. <laughs> I can delete that dot because that's clearly a measurement error and we know that's a measurement error because it's messing up my data. So one of the very first things that we teach people in economics and statistics and business and psychology courses is how in a statistically valid way do we eliminate the weirdos? How do we eliminate the outliers? <laughs> so that we can find the line of best fit, which is fantastic if I'm trying to find out how many Advil the average person should be taking, too. But if I'm interested in potential, if I'm interested in your potential or for happiness or productivity or energy or creativity, what we're doing is we're creating the cult of the average with science. If I ask a question like how fast can a child learn how to read in a classroom, scientists change the answer to how fast does the average child learn how to read in that classroom? And then we tailor the class right towards the average. Now, if you fall below the average on this curve, then psychologists get thrilled because that means you're either depressed or you have a disorder or hopefully both. <laughs> We're hoping for both because our business model is if you come into a therapy session with one problem, we want to make sure you leave knowing you have 10. So you'll keep coming back over and over again. We'll go back into your childhood if necessary, but eventually what we want to do is to make you normal again. But normal is merely average. And what I posit and what positive psychology posits is that if we study what is merely average, we will remain merely average. Then instead of deleting those positive outliers, what I intentionally do is come into a population like this one and says, why? Why is it that some of you are so high above the curve in terms of your intellectual ability, athletic ability, musical ability, creativity, energy levels, your resiliency in the face of challenge, your sense of humor? Whatever it is, instead of deleting you, what I want to do is study you. Because maybe we can glean information, not just how to move people up to the average, but how we can move the entire average up at our companies and schools worldwide. The reason this graph is important to me is when I turn on the news, it seems like the majority of the information is not positive. In fact, it's negative. Most of it's about murder, corruption, diseases, natural disasters, and very quickly, my brain starts to think that's the accurate ratio of negative to positive in the world. What that's doing is creating something called the medical school syndrome which if you know people who have been to medical school during the first year of medical training, as you read through a list of all the symptoms and diseases that could happen, suddenly you realize you have all of them. <laughs> I have a brother-in-law named Bobo, which is a whole other story. Bobo <laughs> married Amy the Unicorn. Bobo called me on the phone <laughs> from Yale Medical School. From Yale Medical School, and Bobo said, Sean, I have leprosy. <laughs> which even at Yale is extraordinarily rare but I had no idea how to console poor Bobo because he had just gotten over an entire week of menopause. <laughs> See, what we're finding is it's not necessarily the reality that shapes us, but the lens through which your brain views the world that shapes your reality. And if we can change the lens, not only can we change your happiness, we can change every single educational and business outcome at the same time. When I applied to Harvard, I applied on a dare. I didn't expect to get in and my family had no money for college. When I got a military scholarship two weeks later, they allowed me to go. Suddenly something that wasn't even a possibility became a reality. When I went there, I assumed everyone else would see it as a privilege as well, that they'd be excited to be there. Even if you're in a classroom full of people smarter than you, you'd be happy just to be in that classroom, which is what I felt. But what I found there is while some people experienced that, when I graduated after my four years and then spent the next eight years living in the dorms with the students, Harvard asked me to, I um, wasn't that guy, but what happened... <laughs> I was an officer of Harvard to counsel students through the difficult four years, and what I found in my research and my teaching is that these students, no matter how happy they were with their original success of getting into the school, two weeks later, their brains were focused not on the privilege of being there, nor on their philosophy or their physics. Their brain was focused on the competition, the workload, the hassles, the stresses, the complaints. When I first went in there, I walked into the freshman dining hall, which is where my friends from Waco, Texas, which is where I grew up, I know some of you have heard of it. Um, when, I, when they come to visit me, they look around, they say, this freshman dining hall looks like something out of Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter, which it does. <laughs> this is Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter, and that's Harvard. And when they see this, they say, Sean, why do you waste your time studying happiness at Harvard? Seriously, what does a Harvard student possibly have to be unhappy about? 
Embedded within that question is the key to understanding the science of happiness. Because what that question assumes is that our ex external world is predictive of our happiness levels. When in reality, if I know everything about your external world, I can only predict 10% of your long-term happiness. 90% of your long-term happiness is predicted not by the external world, but by your, the way your brain processes the world. Did everybody get that? So your designation, your money, your salary, your home, your car, your address, your property can predict 10% of your happiness. 90% of the happiness is how your brain is interpreting the reality you're engaging with. And if we change it, if we change our formula for happiness and success, what we can do is change the way that we can then affect reality. What we found is that only 25% of job successes are predicted by IQ. 75% of job successes are predicted by your optimism levels, your social support, and your ability to see stress as a challenge instead of as a threat. I talked to a boarding school up in New England, probably the most prestigious boarding school, and they said, we already know that. So every year, instead of just teaching our students, we also have a wellness week, and we're so excited. Monday night, we have the world's leading expert coming in to speak about adolescent depression. Tuesday night is school violence and bullying. Wednesday night, <laughs> Wednesday night's eating disorders, Thursday night is illicit drug use, and Friday night we're trying to decide between risky sex or happiness. <laughs> I said that's most people's Friday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm glad you liked, but they did not like that at all. Silence on the phone. And into the silence, I said, I'd be happy to speak at your school, but just so you know, that's not a wellness week, that's a sickness week. What you've done is you've outlined all the negative things that can happen, but not talked about the positive. The absence of disease is not health. Here's how we get to health. We need to reverse the formula for happiness and success. In the past three years, I've traveled to 45 different countries, working with schools and companies in the midst of an economic downturn. And what I found is that most companies and schools follow a formula for success, which is this. If I work harder, I'll be more successful. And if I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. That undergirds most of our parenting styles, our managing styles, the way that we motivate our behavior, and the problem is it's scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. First, every time your brain has a success, you just change the goalpost of what success looked like. You got good grades, now you have to get better grades. You got into a good school, now you have to get a better school. You got a good job, now you have to get a better job. You hit your sales target, we're gonna change your sales target. And if happiness is on the opposite side of success, your brain never gets there. What we've done is we've pushed happiness over the cognitive horizon as a society. And that's because we think we have to be success successful, then we'll be happier. But the real problem is our brains work in the opposite order. If you can raise somebody's level of positivity in the present, then their brain experiences what we now call a happiness advantage, which is your brain at positive performs significantly better than it does at negative, neutral, or stressed. Your intelligence rises, your creativity rises, your energy levels rise. In fact, what we found is that every single business outcome improves. Your brain at positive is 31% more productive than it, your brain at negative, neutral, or stressed. You're 37% better at sales. Doctors are 19% faster, more accurate at coming up with the correct diagnosis when positive instead of negative, neutral, or stressed, which means we can reverse the formula. If we can find a way of becoming positive in the present, then our brains work even more successfully as we're able to work harder, faster, and more intelligently. What we need to be able to do is to reverse this formula so we can start to see what our brains are actually capable of. Because dopamine, which floods into your system when you're positive, has two functions. Not only does it make you happier, it turns on all of the learning centers in your brain, allowing you to adapt to the world in a different way. We found that there are ways you can train your brain to be able to come more positive. In just a two minute span of time, done for 21 days in a row, we can actually rewire your brain, allowing your brain to actually work more optimistically and more successfully. We've done these things in research now in every single company that I've worked with, getting them to write down three new things that they're grateful for for 21 days in a row, three new things each day, and at the end of that, their brain starts to retain a pattern of scanning the world not for the negative, but for the positive first. Journaling about one positive experience you've had over the past 24 hours allows your brain to relive it. Exercise teaches your brain that your behavior matters. We find that meditation allows your brain to get over the cultural ADHD that we've been creating by trying to do multiple tasks at once, and allows our brains to focus on the task at hand. And finally, random acts of kindness or conscious acts of kindness, we get people when they open up their inbox to write one positive email, praising or thanking somebody in their social support network. And by doing these activities, and by training your brain just like we train our bodies, what we found is we could reverse the formula for happiness and success, and in doing so, not only create ripples of positivity, but create a real revolution. Thank you very much. It's a happiness advantage. The brain works in a different way. So don't sacrifice your today. Figure out how to be happier now, and you will be more successful, which is what Phil Zimbardo in 
advocating moderate hedonism is saying the same thing. How does he say to be happier in the present, which means you can become happier by doing a set of things? What are some of the things he said? Number one, gratitude. three gratitudes every day. You're looking for what do I have to celebrate? What can I be grateful for? See, there's a poem by Shelley that says, we look before and after and pine for what is not. Jo nahi hai, usi ki cheshta mein. And the one that we have, we are ignoring. So look for three gratitude, three things that you're grateful for every day. Number two, journal. A positive experience. As you write about the positive experience, your brain relives it. Therefore, it gets internalized faster. Third, meditation, exercise, random acts of kindness, which means you must not say that every last Saturday of the month, I will go to the temple and feed the poor. Do that anyways. But to be kind and generous in the every rhythm of life, as you are living life, be kind and generous. One of the past chairmen of the railway board used to say, Ashwini Lohani, he used to say, if you want to do good, do it straight away. But if you want to be harsh and you want to delay that by a day, the good you do straight away, the harsh you postpone by a day, and that should give you balance, perspective on how you should do it. So random acts of kindness, and finally, writing one positive email praising someone or the other, what I like, what I admire, what I appreciate, etc. And in so doing, he's saying, you will drive more and more happiness at the individual level, group level, organizational level. Finally, what is the culture of emotional intelligence in organization is the one that is chasing differentiated productivity and is celebrating happiness. So ladies and gentlemen, I have said everything I wanted to say in the 90 minutes. If there are any questions, comments, thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions or comments or observations, be glad to take them. Otherwise, I'll leave it to my friend. Yes, any questions, comments? Any insights? Pardon? <laughs> I think you have given a mission to us. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Come. We'll take that. Thank you, sir. I now invite the Honorable CAG of India to please deliver the concluding remarks. Professor Upadhyay, all the senior officer, colleagues, and those who are attending through the virtual mode, it is a really very interesting day today. I thank uh, Professor Upadhyay for very thought-provoking, enlightening, and very spellbinding talk today he has given to us. All of us must have been, you know, throughout our life we have practiced somewhere and other some leadership from level 1 to level 4. But I, what I learned that all of us mostly are hovering around level 4. So how to go above level 4 is a challenge. We all from scriptures and from our whatever family values and our practices and other things must have learned so many things in life. So many of quoted quotations, so many Sukti Malas and so many Hitopades, so many things we have learned, but hardly we have internalized those things. Normally we learn so many things from the environment and so many from the peers and others, but during our studies also, I can talk about myself, I've seen people and I have realized myself that we learn for the sake of learning and just to pass the exam. And many things we don't uh, try to practice. They think that these are all just to be learned. At the same time, in a hilarious side is that you are in the, in the beginning of the 
development of the brain that map i i just you know the drawing i am trying to <laughs> relate to because we are always we are, sub, we are as an organization we are always negative and at that thing because we have to see negative thing only because you are auditors <laughs> so we'll see how it is bad how we have to catch and so we are in that level only so we always see in, in that that kind of evolution we are there so i think perhaps we should we should learn how to evolve ourselves and see that further development along with the environment we should also grow nevertheless this is a very very critical year post pandemic so much of stress all around individually in the family circumstances and everywhere most of our colleagues have suffered many we have lost also and this circumstances globally there is a almost uh, uh, prevailing gloom kind of a situation and wherever little bit i have traveled and i have seen that kind of things are there and most of the countries where the family values and family as an institution is not as it is in india the impact is much more we are very fortunate that we have out of those seven wonder we have eight to under that is family so that family we are that has seen us through in all our thick and thin and uh, perhaps we have also we have our emotional intelligence i whatever today we listen to and perhaps we should try to introspect and see how we can internalize perhaps we also need some training you can have this to you know train us how to master the emotional intelligence that is the core ultimately we are trying to do whatever that is the greatest good of the greatest number how we should be able to contribute to the happiness or the development maybe we are in a different organization but we are part of that uh, ecosystem to see good governance and good governance and uh, integrity in everything transparency so that it translates into some kind of happiness ultimately to the the citizens that is our motto is also there so in our organization in our kind of a situation how to train ourselves uh, is required i i would not like to know because i have not such expertise of looking into the psychology sociology and other analyzing the organizational efficiency and kind of excellence thing but definitely always we should keep our ears and you know eyes open and learn to you know as it was in the during the talk also that we should keep on reinventing and inventing ourselves in, as an organization also and also ourselves also that will you know collectively contribute to the entire institution and ultimately what for we are here so once again i thank him very profusely is a new dimensions we have this is new thing we other ways we have been always like the statistician or the accountants we have been seeing on the raw facts details and this kind of mundane kind of things and these aspects individually you may be pursuing but collectively we have never thought of so i think that we will in future do something so that this aspect is also not, also not neglected ultimately as an institution again i say that our quality and productivity also matters so our emotional happiness or emotional intelligence matters with that i thank you very much thank you all of you
Ms. Mamta Reddy, I thank Professor Padhyay for guiding us on the issues relating to emotional intelligence and having taken out time out of a busy schedule for this outstanding session. I would also like to thank Honorable CAG of India, Sri Jishu Murmu sir, DI, HR, IR and Coordination, Madam Praveen Mehta for their guided continued guidance. Last but not the least, a grateful appreciation to the headquarters wing and staff of SMU who have helped us in the organization of this event. Thank you all for your active participation. I would now like to invite our guests and officers for a high tea served at the atrium. Thank you.